Тому що я Україна, я витримаю Львів, я захищу тебе. All right, we're back after a number of days of meetings here in Kiev. We're back on the train, coming back to Poland. And I'm sitting here with Andrei Leskovich, who runs the Ukraine Defense Fund that is focused on non-lethal aid to Ukraine. Andrei, before we get into that, as we were boarding the train, there was a row upon row upon row of ambulances that were passing by as we were boarding that were waiting for a train with wounded coming back from the front. And it was a very emotional experience. I mean, the whole trip to Kiev was quite emotional, very educational, but um, that scene really was really powerful to see because it really hits home the true cost of this war. And these were wounded, not even killed in action. How dedicated is the Ukrainian society to continue in this war and suffering these terrible casualties, killed and wounded? These, these scenes, we were told, happen not just every day, but today was a fairly light day, despite the fact that there were numerous ambulances. What, what are your impressions seeing that? The war is undoubtedly taking a very heavy toll. Uh, people, especially those living closer to the front, uh, everyone can tell you they've seen caravans of ambulances uh, rushing from the front to the city and then people get tri triaged and sent to Kiev, to Lviv, to other cities. And every time you see this caravan, you know something went horribly wrong. And uh, that means that there are wounded, killed, uh, and Ukraine has a much smaller population than Russia and it cannot sustain one-to-one -one losses. Uh, we don't know what the actual ratio is with, with the enemy, but uh, it is very clear that this cannot continue indefinitely. Uh, what we don't know is, of course, uh, credible total numbers. We know what's reported by the general staff. Uh, but there's no independent way, way of validating these numbers. Um, but clearly, the toll is significant. And, you know, the other thing that was striking walking around Kiev is the number of people with amputated limbs that are walking around. You, you could tell that this is affecting everyone. We had a taxi driver taking us, was talking about now having a newborn. And uh, as we were leaving, told us that he hopes that the war will be over by the time his son is old enough to serve. Just incredible toll. But let, let's talk about what needs to happen to win this war, win this conflict. There's so much focus, and including on this podcast, frankly, about lethal weapons, whether Ukraine needs F-16s, what kind of tanks they need, what's the situation with artillery, but of course, as the saying goes, wars aren't won with weapons, they're won with logistics. And logistics include trucks, they include fuel, they include night vision goggles, they include lots of things that you actually need to make the weapons effective and to achieve the desired outcome that you're interested in. We'll talk about what you perceive the needs are, and you spent a lot of time coming back to Ukraine, not just interfacing with Ukrainian military command, but, but also with troops at the front line, which you visit regularly. What are you focused on from the Ukrainian Defense Fund perspective in the non-lethal area? I would start by saying that uh, when you talk to the troops, the, the list of needs is much larger than the list that's being communicated to allies. Um, you could argue it's justified. The leadership wants to prioritize things that are the most scarce, weapons in particular. Uh, I'll just give you a quick anecdote. We're meeting with someone very senior in the Ukrainian MOD, and they told us that they need just five things. And those five things are shells, 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 and shells. So that's sort of the attitude. And of course, we know that artillery is a critical part of this, this war. Ammunition is a lot, but it's not everything, right? Ammunition is certainly one of the most scarce and critical resources, but at the same time, uh, you ultimately need to hit a target. And to hit a target, you need to aim, and if you don't hit the first time, you need to correct fire, and you need to adjust settings on your artillery systems and fire again. And when you look at what's involved in that, it's 
a range of equipment that oftentimes is commercial, available commercially that anyone can buy on Amazon. Like drones, right? Like drones, like Starlinks, like batteries, like tablets, um, phones, etc. So these things are needed to close the uh, loop. And in order to do that, you often need to find these assets someplace. And in reality, almost all those assets are not being bought centrally, and they're not being provided by allies. And, and, why, and why is that? Uh, well, the fundamental reason behind that, at least when it comes to the U.S., is that the funds available for purchasing of new equipment for Ukraine are USAI and FMF funds that are primarily used for lethal equipment. Um, Ukraine knows that they can be used for lethal equipment, therefore they're maxing out lethal orders. There have been some trivial examples. In December, there was a batch of generators bought. Uh, there were some other examples of non-lethal assets provided through them. But Ukraine is not requesting them because they know that if push comes to shove, it's possible to buy commercial equipment with money without the U.S., but it's very difficult to buy the weapons. So they're prioritizing the weapons. At the same time, what I believe they don't fully appreciate is that the limits on lethal military aid are often not monetary. It's often supply chain problems, it's often escalation risks, or just sheer bureaucracy involved in contracting for these types of equipment. And to the extent to which lethal aid cannot be increased, not because of money issues, but because of these other constraints, my argument is that it is absolutely possible to augment overall capacity of the Ukrainian military by providing these kinds of assets that act as a multiplier on conventional weapon systems. And these types of equipment are, I would say, the high priority assets fall into four categories. Uh, one of them is mobility, and that's transportation of different kinds from beat up Ford F 150s. Ukraine doesn't even need new vehicles. As long as it's decent all wheel drive diesel pickup truck, that's going to be very useful. Just to transport troops and equipment to the yes. front. And the reason why you can be certain that it's useful is because when troops p vote with their own money, they buy that. If you go to the front, you will see a lot of people driving their own pickup trucks. Even if they're not driving them into the trenches, they might be doing this slightly in the rear, you know, a couple kilometers away from the zero line. But this high reliance on these types of vehicles, cargo vans, buses, big, uh, larger trucks. The second big category is uh, portable energy. So this is generators, this is uh, power stations of big batteries that you can bring with you. And remember, when you're at the front, you are basically away from civilization. You don't have normal connectivity, you don't have electricity, you don't have running water. So all of these things that you take for granted in the city are not available. So even for basic existence, you need to substitute them with some portable version of that. So portable energy is one big category that's needed to charge all your devices, to power your equipment, etc. So it's a big need. The third category is critical. Uh, it's comms equipment. And in the comms equipment category, by far the most important product is Starlinks. So Starlinks have played decisive role in building decentralized comms network that uh, allows the troops to communicate along the chain of command and to uh, correct fire and be directly involved in closing the loop on um, you know, the work of the artillery and other systems. And there is really no alternative to Starlink, right? Talk a little bit about why that might be. Um, I wouldn't say there is literally no alternative, but for all intents and purposes, that's an accurate statement. So there is a number of competitors, but they generally rely on uh, satellites that have much higher orbit, that have longer latency. Uh, geostationary satellites often require manual adjustment of a, of a, a terminal, so it, it's aimed at the right satellite. Uh, and they have much higher car price point, and in general, they're not portable. When you move, the, you stop getting connectivity. Uh, they also slower, the bandwidth is 10x lower on, on many of them. Uh, and the satellite system that Ukraine relied on on the first day of the war was hacked by the Russians. and the, Viasat. Uh, Viasat was uh, not available through mid-May last year. So Viasat is one other alternative, but it's not uh, superior. On, on every spec it's worse, it's longer latency, it's not portable, it's slower, uh, both on uplink and downlink. 
so it's it's at best a plan B now in case something happens to Starlink. So Starlink is, is a critical product. And, and Starlink is really hard to jam as well, right? Yes, they use a higher frequency, uh, they're in 12, 13 gigahertz range that uh, Russians have not been jamming so far. Uh, and they have not been, even been able to locate the terminals. We are not aware of any single example of terminals being uh, identified using the terminal itself. There have been cases of Wi-Fi routers being identified, but not the terminal itself. Uh, and they've been uh, very simple to use. It's another major benefit. All you need to do is to plug it into an electrical outlet, and then it, within a couple minutes it starts working. People are literally running them off car batteries, right? Yes, car batteries or portable batteries from the category I mentioned. Uh, they sometimes put them on cars and they work in motion. Uh, they can be deployed in the trenches. They can be deployed all sorts of places. Command and control posts use them. So Starlink is a very big component of this radio, uh, of, this, of this comms category. So it's cheaper. It's much easier to use. There's no alignment issues. Very easy to train people to set up. Yes. Right, higher bandwidth and much harder to jam and thus it's really not just the most ideal option but really realistically the one that you can really um, use at the front at every the, level. The challenge of course is uh, the, in, in the fact that in some areas of the front there is saturation of these so speeds go down and there's sometimes issues with latency but again, at the macro level, this is a major tool that is also asymmetric vis-a-vis -vis Russia. I mean, wars are about asymmetry. Uh, Russia does not have a comparable capability. They rely heavily on wired connectivity. They literally put wires in trenches. Uh, and uh, that means they're far less mobile and it, it, it's more difficult for them to maintain comms along the chain of command. Although you can't jam fixed lines. Uh, and you also cannot intercept uh, comms as easily. So there are benefits to that, but at the same time, it's really old school stuff that's available to Ukraine. So when you have a choice, Ukraine is using these portable solutions that are not tethered to one uh, location. Uh, the second big component of this comms category is radio, uh, portable radios that people carry with them. Uh, the most prominent brand is Motorola, there's also Hytera and L3 Harris. Uh, they are needed, most of them can be bought without any expert controls. Um, they're basically commercial radios, at least in the first two categories. Uh, the other uh, comms piece that's very essential is portable cell towers, because they allow you to plug in a Starlink and then make it effectively available much wider than a Wi-Fi router would allow you to do that. So you would, you would be able to simply uh, pair them and then have several kilometer radius where people can use their regular phones to connect and have data links. Uh, and of course, uh, Ukraine needs a large number of end-user devices like phones, tablets, laptops, sometimes monitors that, again, anyone can buy, but they are constantly needed because they use them for maps, they use them for intel, they use them for uh, remote control of various uh, drones, etc. So this, that's a huge need. I hope with the cell towers at least uh, recording them because the Russians may be able to join them too. Uh, yes, the, the, early in the war they were handing out free SIM cards to Ukrainian um, cellular providers that allowed Ukrainians to identify locations of Russian troops. Uh, of course, Russians have um, remedied that and they now have their own towers and they have their own faux towers that trick Ukrainian phones into connecting. So it's, it's a game that two sides can play, but it's, it's a big needed category. And the fourth category, and it's very wide, uh, it's intelligence, counterintelligence, and electronic warfare assets. So think of this as sensors of different kinds, platforms for delivery of those sensors, which could be drones, which could be telescopic masts, aerostats, rovers, and software that ties them together. And, and, and sensors could be imagery, cameras, they could be radio. radio. frequency, they could be acoustic. So there's a lo long range of different sensors. And you can, when you think of a drone, it's basically a camera that you can fly with. So it's delivery platform coupled with a sensor. So uh, when you think of these categories, they sometimes uh, comprise one big, bigger product. And, and drones is one of the most prominent categories. And uh, again, the goal for these is to augment the kill chain. But the flip side of that is you also need to be able to disrupt the enemy kill chain. So electronic warfare assets that 
allow you to jam either navigation or comms uh, systems of Russian drones or Russian portable radios is another major need. Um, and this is a cat and mouse game that both sides are constantly playing. So I would say these four major categories are the ones uh, that Ukraine needs in large quantities. When you look at how they're being delivered, uh, it's almost entirely either direct purchases by the troops themselves or by NGOs that are supporting the military. Like, like your NGO? Uh, like my NGO and the number of Ukrainian domestic NGOs that raise money domestically. And we should point out your NGO is a 501c3 yes. American organization, tax deductible, so Americans often provide you with funds that you use to buy this type of equipment for Ukraine. Yes, the folks who are interested in supporting this effort can go to ukrainedefensefund.org and make a tax-deductible contribution that we'll use to help Ukraine Defense Forces with non-lethal equipment. Uh, and our argument is that this non-lethal equipment is incredibly important to the overall effectiveness of the uh, of these forces because they augment, not substitute, lethal assets. Uh, and they play an enormous role. And when, when the key thing that people don't fully understand is that the impact is not marginal. The impact is profound. When you look at the Soviet norms for expenditure of artillery shells in offensive operations, a division is supposed to use 50,000 shells per an eight kilometer stretch for the, the targets that are in the hundreds. So that means about 60 shells per target. So they basically do aerial bombardment of the defense uh, segment or quadrant that the enemy division holds. and. Um, when you look at how many shells are expended, when you can observe each individual shell landing and then correct fire off of that, the number is an order of magnitude lower. It's not around the edges. It's a profound impact on accuracy. And given that ammo is one of the most constrained assets in this war, where production capacity in the West is often maxed out, making sure that every shell is used as accurately as possible is a very high priority goal. And surveillance drones are accomplishing that coupled with Starlinks, coupled with uh, consumer electronics, etc. And w when you actually look at how this is done, you would often have the small UAV team, often two guys, they would use a pickup truck that, that has seen a, a lot of miles. Uh, they would uh, all-wheel drive. They would drive very close to the front. They would disembark. They would carry a Starlink and a generator or a... Uh, battery with them uh, they would find some hideout some place where they can launch a drone from and they would launch a drone that you could buy on Best Buy often Chinese made DJI drone and they would communicate with their chain of command on the phone using WhatsApp or Signal and on top of that they would of course um, have a tablet with the map that's synced via Starlink and it has all the targets and that also allows them to mark the uh, areas where the shell has landed because they can see the explosion from uh, the drone. So every single piece of this chain is commercial equipment. It's not even dual use. It's commercial that anyone can buy without any restrictions using just their personal funds. And this is what has been happening and this is what has enabled both NGOs and the troops themselves to buy this equipment. What's shocking to many who come to Ukraine is that the troops routinely spend fifth to a quarter of their salaries on buying equipment for themselves and for their units. I was just... Th th this is what's really amazing, right? We have spent already $50 billion of aid just in the U.S. military aid to Ukraine. This is clearly a critical need, and yet somehow there's a breakdown between the troops at the front line that need it to the requests they are going to the U.S., because most of the stuff is really, really cheap in comparison to yes. M1 Abrams tanks or even F-16s that we're now yes. debating and everything else, right? This is yeah, on the order of tens of thousands, not millions or tens of millions. This most common drone at the front costs about $2,000. And again, it's something that, compared to the cost of a single shell, which costs three to $4,000. So it's half the price of a shell and, and it, it saves, you know, easily eight, nine out of ten shells that you fire compared to uncorrected artillery fire. That's what we call fantastic return on investment. Yes, so it's essential. Of course, the problem is that these are Chinese-made drones, 
and the best US draw in the same category is worse on every single spec and costs five to seven times more. This this is the DJI Mavic drones? Uh, the Chinese ones are DJI Mavic drones, yes. The US analogs are substantially inferior and costlier. Also supply constraint, they're not making anywhere near as many as DJI does. Um, at the same time, there's a lot of other equipment that's, you know, Starlinks, for example, are needed in large quantities and Chinese uh, don't have an equivalent system. So this is one of the cases of um, asymmetric advantages the West has at present. Um, even consumer electronics, you can think this is trivial, tablets, but they needed to load maps and you know, have these uh, things be visible um, to the people who are operating equipment and who are correcting this fire. And when you look at the reasons why these are not being requested, it's, it's largely this focus on this fear of cannibalization of lethal aid, because lethal, of course, is critical, and that's what's being communicated to the U.S. in, in the requests from Ukraine from the top leadership. Uh, my personal opinion, having talked to a lot of senior stakeholders in Ukraine, is that the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense does not fully appreciate the importance of these assets. And there are historic reasons for this. If you look at the norms for outfitting individual troops, sections, platoons, companies, battalions, these norms were formulated decades ago. These are often inherited from the Soviet era uh, standards. and at the time, drones didn't exist, Starlings didn't exist, so a lot of these items are just brand new. And they just have not gone through the planning process where these so-called staff schedules, these norms, have been updated to reflect these needs. And as a result, the MOD is not buying them with their own funds, by and large. There are some exceptions, uh, but there are many of these non-lethal categories that are overlooked because they're relatively new technology, very effective, but something that, that, that has not existed for that, uh, that much time. And there's also a lot of um, concern about, uh, okay, we, we have something effective, but it's made by China. Can we institutionalize purchasing through the uh, Ukrainian MOD? Maybe China won't sell directly. So a lot of these have been procured using horizontal connections and parallel import, people buying through third countries, et cetera. Well, there's also an issue that US, US taxpayer dollars probably will not be used to buy Chinese drones, I can tell you that. Yeah. Uh, that's a fair observation, but at the same time, there's a lot of other equipment uh, that on this list that can be bought, night vision equipment. It's made in the U.S., very high quality. Um, if, when you look at the current counteroffensive, it, at this point, it's largely nighttime operations by the infantry, and you would have a company that approaches the enemy positions, and out of 100 people, two have night vision goggles. Their effectiveness could be drastically higher if they simply all had night vision devices. And these are, what, $4,000? Yeah, these are on the order of three to five thousand dollars depending on what they are and it's both personal and the ones that they can put on anti-aircraft uh, man pads uh, to offset the Russian uh, aerial uh, superiority at night helicopters in particular uh, basically stingers and others that they would use to shoot them down they, they, they showed me the map uh, of the counter-offensive operation near Rehiv and Russian helicopters were literally for flying over them like not even from a distance of 10 kilometers, they were literally flying over them uh, because at night they they lacked the ability to aim their man pads. Um, so there's been quite a few examples where simple purchases of commercial, and some of this is, um, like night vision in particular, higher end is more more restricted. It's you can, you can buy it for domestic use, but it's hard to export. At the same time, the U.S. government could easily export, like it could grant itself the export license. Uh, so there's quite a few of these categories that would play a significant role and uh, help with logistics on the transportation side, with mobility at the front, uh, help with autonomy of the people in the trench so they have the ability to recharge their radio so they don't lose connectivity, for example, or can provide intel through uh, Starlink, uh, or have radios to talk while they are on these missions so they can coordinate their actions better. And secure radios that can be intercepted. Yeah, secure radios that have encrypted uh, at least voice channel and ideally data channel as well. So let, let's talk a little bit about drones because maybe one of the first wars that had seen extensive use of drones in all aspects of the operation was a couple of years ago, the war between Armenia and Azerbaijan and Aborn and Karabakh. But this war has taken it to a whole new level where both sides are using drones for lots of different missions. 
Let, let's talk a little bit about how they're being used and what effect they're having. I would say broadly there are two major categories. One is uh, reconnaissance drones, the so-called ISR, Intelligence Surveillance Reconnaissance Drones, and the second category is strike drones. Um, sometimes the same drone can do both, uh, depending on the payload. Um, I would say the most common use case now uh, is the ISR use case. This is using a commercially available drone that you could put up in the sky at the altitude of a um, few hundred meters uh, that allows you to see up to 10 kilometers out, including the range of the drone itself and the zoom of the camera that's on the drone. And then when an artillery system is used or you know, a mortar uh, is used, you observe where shells land and you try to correct them. And you can or, do this in real time with Starlink, right? Yes, you can do it in real time by streaming video or, or just having the coordinates of the shots communicated via Starlink. But there's now quite a lot uh, of video streaming happening. You can go to the general staff and see live video from drones at the front on big projectors and big screens. So they're now being available and to the through the chain of command. Uh, plus they get analyzed remotely. They don't need to necessarily have analysts at the very front to look at them. Uh, one of the major use cases for them is uh, identifying targets so before you start shooting you want to know whether the enemy is approaching you want to see what kinds of targets might be promising uh, sometimes these same drones are used as strike drones by attaching a grenade to them or something like that using a simple contraption um, I think this is a less effective use case although it appears effective when you see Twitter videos with you know dramatic uh, drops that uh, certainly a lot of videos of drones dropping grenades on yes. tanks and trenches and yes. the like so uh, the problem is that those videos are largely cherry-picked. I think their average efficacy is not very high for this application. And the amount of payload they can carry is very limited, which means that you may be able to hit an infantry person. And if you're extremely lucky, you can hit the tank in the exact right spot, but it's very rare. So what you don't see is all the failed missions. Uh, so at the same time, it's pretty graphic, and I'm sure everyone has, has seen uh, these videos. So in the ISR category, in the intelligence category, uh, I would differentiate these drones by range. So the, the most prevalent and the most common drone is the one that has a range of you know, up to 10, 12 kilometers. This is including Mavics and Matrices, the two types of DJI drones made in China. Um, the problem with them is that they cannot correct artillery at its maximal range. So artillery has longer range than 10 to 15 kilometers. And Ukraine is lacking sufficient number of larger drones that can go up to, say, 30 kilometers and properly correct that artillery in real time and find targets for it. Uh, usually those drones are not quadcopters. They're usually fixed-wing aircraft. The, the longer range. They're longer range, and they are more expensive. They cost oftentimes one, two, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000 per system, so it's two orders of magnitude more expensive than a small quadcopter. Uh, however, they have longer range, they have longer endurance, they often have better payload, so better zoom, better ability to track, uh, better night vision, uh, thermal camera, and they are uh, often more resilient to jamming because they have hardened GPS and they have hardened communication system. But they're more expensive. So there's, that's why they're more expensive. Uh, among, uh, they're also more expensive because they're not really... Uh, quite as commercially available as quadcopters. There are fewer civilian applications for them. There are some agricultural, there are some industrial applications, but it's not, as a, it's not a consumer device. Very few people need a plane that flies around and gives you uh, GPS, but uh, they are uh, just not uh, as a uh, serially made product that you would see in a commercial uh, setting, uh, in a commercial consumer setting. Um, and then there is very long range drones, so sometimes have multi-hundred kilometer range and um, those often use gasoline engines so the medium range drones often use electrical uh, power they're quieter and they often have vertical takeoff and landing and then there are larger drones that go farther and uh, they of course need um, diesel yeah diesel or gasoline i think in some cases i i, I, I don't uh, claim to know much about the fuel they use but they are uh, heavier, they are louder, and have longer endurance, uh, and those drones are used for uh, surveillance way behind the enemy lines. They also need are needed to find spec out targets for uh, 
high mars that have longer range 70 kilometers plus now there are of course storm shadows that have even longer range so you often need you may have satellite imagery that gives you an idea of where the targets are but satellite imagery is always delayed by many hours and before you shoot you need to be certain when you drop a you know three million dollar weapon on a missile on a target you really want to know that the target is there uh, so they either work with stationary targets or they want to make sure there's concentration of troops or equipment someplace. So they used for something like that. Um, and then there is uh, another large category of drones are these strike or attack drones. Some of them are kamikaze drones, some of them are bombers that drop munitions but the vehicle itself is uh, reusable. So with kamikaze drones, the most popular in terms of quantities has been this category of FPV, first person view drones, where you put on VR headset and you are literally operating the drone by looking at the input from its camera. You're flying this drone at fairly high speed. These are racing drones that you know, fly you know, 80, 90 miles an hour pretty fast. If they have no payload, if they put payload, they're slower. They require much more skill uh, because if they're far less automated, you are manually controlling every maneuver. Take two months to train somebody from scratch, it's, and many people just can never be trained on them because of the challenges of using VR headsets. Some people just have health reasons why they cannot do this. It needs good reaction, and it, it's, it's complicated to, to train people for that. At the same time, they're uh, able to complement mortars in some cases. They are able to precisely hit targets. They're very good at... Uh, exposed targets. They can hit uh, infantry that's advancing. They can hit uh, unarmored vehicles and destroy them. And they can immobilize armored vehicles. And sometimes, if they're lucky, destroy armored vehicles. Uh, the the point of immobilizing a vehicle uh, is to make it exposed to artillery, because once a tank is stuck someplace, it can be hit by artillery. That's not very good at hitting moving targets. So it's it's a uh, drone that has a lot of applications in defensive operations where the enemy is advancing and is exposed and is not covered by their EW uh, capabilities as much because they get out of that umbrella. Electronic warfare. Electronic warfare uh, capabilities that jam these drones. The beauty of these drones is they're very cheap. They cost several hundred dollars and a range, they have a range of you know, three and sometimes three kilometers or more. Uh, and again, these drones work well in close, uh, close range operations where the enemy is exposed. They're less effective in defensive, in offensive operations where the enemy is fortified and not exposed, masked in many cases. Um, right now, the, Russia is, well, the Russian forces are using them to significant effect against Ukrainian armor. Ukraine is having much harder time deploying them against the Russian forces because they're all fortified and, and, and not really exposed. Uh, but the situation was reversed in Bakhmut and various other areas. So now the balance has changed, just shifted based on the nature of the operation. But in any large offensive, there's always counter-offensives and counter-counter-offensives. So whenever you are on a defensive in a micro sense, like in a particular battle, uh, that becomes a useful tool. Uh, there are larger drones that can carry larger payload and fly farther and uh, have some levels of... Like, like say, to Moscow, hypothetically. Say to Moscow, yeah, all of these drones that Ukraine allegedly didn't launch that somehow arrived in Moscow and uh, blew up. Uh, yeah, these kamikaze drones have much higher price point. They do require some levels of hardening against uh, GPS jamming and uh, some level of inertial system, etc., so they can fly on their own. Uh, the uh, challenge with those, of course, they're really not free. They cost tens of thousands of dollars, and so then you need to decide uh, how many of them do you need to actually hit the target, because some of them get destroyed with anti-aircraft systems. But uh, the, important, the importance of these drones is that they have significantly long, longer range than artillery, and so they can try to disrupt logistical hubs, they can try to um, create all kinds of complications with resupply lines like uh, oil refineries, etc., or storages of Well, we've oil. seen stories in newspapers based on these Pentagon leaks, for example, about Ukraine allegedly destroying AWACS aircraft in Belarus, of which Russia only has a few, using those types of drones. So 
they can have very outsized effects if you can hit the right target. Uh, let's talk a little bit about electronic warfare because you know drones sound wonderful, you can surveil, you can hit targets, but there's countermeasures to everything and electronic warfare has been used fairly effectively by both sides to try to minimize the impact of drones, right? Yes, Russia has been ahead, I would say, historically on electronic warfare capabilities and uh, I would break it up in two buckets. One is their attempt to interfere with navigation systems. Uh, that means them jamming GPS and other uh, navigation constellations so that the drone that's flying doesn't know where it is and as a result cannot accurately hit the target if it's a uh, kamikaze drone or cannot uh, stabilize itself in the air if it's an ISR drone uh, and cannot accurately communicate coordinates to the command. Uh, there's a number of countermeasures to these. Uh, one is having an inertial system. Uh, that's a system that allows you to... Uh, that, that's something that has been used for a long time uh, in old school missiles that pre-existed GPS and you know could fly with some level of accuracy uh, in the past. The issue with this uh, type of system is that it does accumulate error over time. So if you need to fly for a significant amount of time, you will be unlikely to hit the target, and, and you will almost certainly drift away, and both in terms of angle and in terms of lateral shift. Uh, the second major approach is to use a hardened GPS module, not the consumer one, that, that's very cheap. And the general idea behind these modules is that they're trying to identify the source of jamming. Usually the jamming is uh, coming from the ground, which is different direction than the satellites that are in the sky and then attenuate the set signal. So they try to um, position the antennas in such a way that attenuates the source of jamming. And of course, if you have multiple sources of jamming, it becomes more difficult because you now need to deal with multiple axes, uh, which might become impossible. And what they also do is they use redundant number of satellite uh, constellations. They use GLONASS, they use uh, Galileo, the European one, and I think they use the Chinese one. So that's the second class of solutions. Uh, the third class of solutions is using optical navigation instead. So that's uh, trying to look at the camera and compare it to the map. Because comparing the landmarks, the roads, the intersections, the anything of note to uh, the map of the area and deciding where you are based on that. Uh, and finally, there are uh, more experimental approaches that would use non-traditional satellites, not GPS, but other satellites that know their location, and now there's a lot of low Earth orbit satellites that are much more plentiful and would be much more difficult to jam uh, at higher frequencies that could be a substitute for GPS in, in the longer term. So uh, there's been a number of measures and countermeasures with GPS jamming. The second class of um, risks associated with jamming is uh, the interference with the comms link that the operator has with the drone. And um, commercial drones all have this uh, Achilles heel of operating on standard Wi-Fi frequencies because they all get certified for applications in a commercial setting, so they have well-known uh, standard frequencies that the enemy knows just as well, and so they can try to interfere with that particular frequency, making these drones lose contact with the operator and land or not be able to return uh, back to the base. Uh, and so more sophisticated systems, so not consumer made, but um, for example, fixed wing aircraft that would use something better, they would try to use frequency hopping, they would try to use non-standard frequencies, and whenever they detect interference, they try to dynamically adjust which channel, which frequency they're using. Uh, and uh, that approach is now also a cat and mouse game where the other side can sit with the spectrum analyzer and try to understand which frequency this shifted to. They tr can try to identify the signature of this drone and decide which particular drone it is and which particular comm system it's using and then try to interfere with that. Uh, so that's another major challenge to deal with. And by the way, as, as you talk about all these countermeasures to UW, the more of them you use, and depending on which one you decide to use, this makes the drone much more expensive because you're immediately out of the range, in many, many of these cases, of commercial equipment. You're now in specialized equipment, and some of these systems can cost more than your drone, right? Yes, just to give you a sense, of, again, as I said, commercial drone, like Mavic 3, can be bought for $2,000, even less if you don't buy spare batteries. Uh, 
just a single hardened GPS module it may cost ten thousand dollars. Just just the GPS module, and then the kind of best in class comms link for these drones could be five to seven thousand dollars. And this is not counting ground equipment for them because they might need fairly large antennas. And uh, I mean, the, some of the best in class antennas could cost sixty grand just for the tracker antenna. So, uh, just the equipment needed to maintain communication and navigation could be extremely expensive when you're trying to uh, interface with the enemy that's sophisticated and is trying to disrupt them very actively. So this becomes a question of uh, this literal arms race where you are trying to be a step ahead of the enemy and uh, the big question is can we have a different asymptote than the enemy? Can we have some lasting asymmetry in capabilities with them? And by the way, this is where the sanctions are a critical tool because from what sanctions I can tell, on Russia. Yeah, the sanctions on Russia and, and the restrictions of their ability to buy components from, say, Texas Instruments or from analog devices, from Nvidia, uh, which they still are buying through parallel import. They have intermediaries that buy on their behalf, uh, but any restriction makes it more difficult and costly. And I think that's an essential thing to maintain. In some sense, I'm more in favor of more targeted but more rigid sanctions than a very wide range of things being covered. Stricter enforcement on critical components would make a big difference over time where they would deplete their access to these tools or it would limit their scale at which they can produce them. I've been involved in procurement for these while being on the friendly side. And I can tell you, even if you have all the ducks in a row, it's still extremely complex to buy these. These transactions take months to put together and deliver these products. Uh, so putting additional constraints on that will certainly not make the lives easier on the Russian side. Yeah. Uh, the one thing you didn't mention with the W is obviously you can interfere with the drone itself, you can try to jam the communications or the navigation, but the other thing you can do is try to find out where the controller is, right, and to try to target those people. And there's been a lot of concern with some of these commercial drones about advertising signals and, and helping to identify the people that are actually running them. What, what are some of the countermeasures to that? Well, as, uh, as a radio emitter, like every controller has a radio emitter and every drone has a radio emitter. And as a result, they can be uh, detected and they could be localized. Uh, so there's a way to uh, find bearing, find direction, at, uh, and intersect it from multiple points, triangulate the location of any emitter of uh, RF um, signal. And uh, Russians have been doing this, but for commercial drones in particular, there's an easier way. Uh, DJI sells, or at least used to sell, um, these devices called aeroscopes that allow you to literally see the coordinates of these drones, the drone itself communicates to the pilot. So they're not trying to triangulate the location of the drone or the pilot. They're simply listening in on the comms and just knowing what these what, what the coordinates communicated back and forth. And the immediate countermeasure to that is trying to spoof those coordinates. So last year Ukraine uh, jailbroke these DJI devices and allowed them to communicate fake coordinates, like zero zero instead of actual latitude and longitude which would make these drones appear off the coast of Africa rather than in an actual battlefield, so the, they would appear in an irrelevant area on aeroscope. Maybe even better to uh, broadcast Russian coordinates. <laughs> Possibly. In fact, they thought about this, but uh, it took several additional months for Russia to acquire the same capability. Now they're doing the same thing. They're jailbreaking and anonymizing these drones. Um, and the counter, one of the countermeasures to this was also creating spoofers that creates signal that replicates fake DJI drones. And these are extremely cheap. For 100 bucks, you can create a device that effectively pretends to be a DJI drone. And I was repeatedly in an area where, uh, on one of my trips to Ochakiv uh, in the south, it's, a, it's on the uh, border of, uh, on the bank of Dnipro River, facing Kingbird um, Spit, that um, they placed one of these devices, turned them on, and a swarm of Ukrainian drones appeared on Russian aeroscopes, and that resulted in artillery strikes at the device that cost 50 bucks. So they sent grads 
Uh, I think they, they, they... Grads are the multiple launch rocket systems yes, that the Russians they, they use. use the entire grad uh, load, which, if I remember correctly, is something like 40 rockets. It's a very expensive shot. Uh, at a device that costs nothing, like some sub-$100 device. So uh, there are measures that they can take to try to understand whether this is a real signal or not. But So this is a cat and mouse. But this is still within the realm of having direct access to the communication between the drone and the, and the controller. And, and of course, the high priority there is not the drone, it's the controller. You want to know where the controller is and try to do strikes against those. Ukraine has executed quite a few of those strikes. And in some cases, in fact, on that same trip where I, when I was in Achakiv, they hit the pilot who was flying out of an ammo depot. So they saw a massive explosion. So the pilot somehow didn't take any precautions and was flying out of a place that was really not the right the right spot to choose. Uh, however, once you get away from DJI, uh, you basically need to go back to, to the physics of this and you need to figure out how do you localize the source of signal. And there are devices that do that. And Ukraine has deployed a number of them. Russia has deployed a number of them. And what they're focusing on is assembling a library of signatures for different types of devices. So when they see a signature of a particular device, they can tell oh, this is that particular drone or that particular drone. And then they localize where it is or at least tell you the direction. For some of the drones, they can only tell you whether or not the drone is within range. Uh, but that's often sufficient so they can start taking some measures. If they know it's flying over, they will kind of seize operations or go and cover, take uh, safer positions, etc. So that's another set of tools that they're deploying to try to monitor the use of drones. And one important thing here is that because both sides are often using the same types of drones bought from China, there's this big disambiguation question. Which of these drones are friendly drones, which are not? Uh, and this friend or foe identification is a major weakness of the Ukrainian deployment that's decentralized. Because when everyone brings their own drone, they're not part of any larger system that knows who is who. And so you often end up in friendly fire uh, situations where, again, by my assessment, at least in the past, over half of the drones that Ukraine lost were due to friendly fire. Uh, because they were returning from mission, the, the infantry would see them and they would just open fire at them. Uh, and again, now things have slightly improved, but um, I think it's still a major problem. Friendly fire remains an issue. So you mentioned jailbreaking. So for, for our audience that doesn't know, jailbreaking is essentially being able to modify the code, the firmware that's on those drones. A very complicated thing because you effectively have to hack it because DJI does not let you modify that code easily so you have to find exploits to compromise that firmware and modify it so that it's changing the coordinates that it sends or doesn't send them at all uh, whatever the case may be a lot of high-tech efforts to do this and the drones keep evolving there are new variants that are coming out so this is a continuous need as well to figure out how to jailbreak those phones for people that are familiar with iPhone jailbreaks there's you know a whole industry dedicated to this to try to allow people to sideload apps on your iPhone that are not coming through the Apple App Store and it's a very very complicated business there are literally probably a few hundred people in the world that are capable of doing this and for DJI it's really the same situation they're using the Android operating system not not iOS obviously but still very very secure built to be very secure by Google so to compromise it is, is really challenging and as these drones keep evolving this remains a big problem for Ukraine, right? Yes, every version of firmware requires this to be done from scratch. And last year they were able to do this for three or four versions of firmware, but with every duration, the um, measures that DJI took have made it more difficult. And there's currently a drone in the market, the most recent version of Mavic, called Mavic 3 Pro, that still does not have a functional jailbreak. Uh, and the previous versions... And that means it can be used because it's too dangerous to use it, right? It, it can be used with the risk. Yeah. So, and people are taking these risks because uh, the supply of previous models is rapidly depleting. Because, again, they're phas phasing out previous models of drones in favor of this new one. And as a result, uh, again, previous solutions no longer apply. So one of the high priority task tasks for Ukraine now is to find a workaround. I mean, to, to underscore this point, people are literally dying right now 
because there's no jailbreak for this latest yes. drone version. Uh, no question about it. No question about it. Uh, it's an incredibly important asset on the battlefield. Uh, one thing you may ask is why not find a replacement for DJI? Why rely on an adversarial manufacturer? The problem is that there's no better there's no there's no better solution. Uh, I'm hearing that some of the newer versions of hotels might be somewhat competitive in some applications, but it's unclear uh, that that will be uh, the case all over the front. And, and these are hotels are um, a competitor. Basically, it's a competitor to DJI. They make uh, drones that, in the last year, have not performed too well in Ukraine because of their relatively weak data link. It's a. Uh, it's also effectively a Chinese company that has U.S. presence, and they have different models for U.S. market than uh, China. They are more readily available. It's easier to buy them. Uh, but it seems like China just dominates this whole market. Yes, they, they do, and and it's uh, the, the problem is that there's no easy way. I see no viable way of uh, building something that's at par with DJI Mavic uh, in Ukraine in the next year or two or maybe even beyond that so because no, they're so cheap because they're so cheap and because they have used uh, I mean their scale is dramatic they make you know, millions of drones a year and I mean the largest US vendor maybe makes tens of thousands so the economies of scale that they've been able to reach are just outside of anything that Ukraine can attain in the short term and the amount of investment they received from the government that subsidized the uh, software and the integration efforts and the, the payload, the, the vertically integrated solution that is very difficult to reassemble from Lego blocks because they're all neatly uh, integrated, vertically integrated. So it's it's a, an important, important tool that Russia is also using very extensively. And early in the war, they, they had few of them. Now they have more of them than, than Ukraine because they have much easier ability to buy them in Russia. Even though formally DJI has exited both markets, but in practice, the parallel import into Russia is easier. And the challenge now is how do you enhance parallel import? So how do you make sure you can buy more of them, just actual devices, physically bring them into Ukraine? Because there are distributors now trying to throttle the order sizes, etc., and they're trying to sniff out orders that are actually aimed at Ukraine. The second thing that's critical is this jailbreak. Um, and finally, there are modifications that can be made to these drones to harden them, like in particular using external antennas, sometimes adding a second battery that extends range. And so these are the three things that can be done with these drones that are very high priority, but I think building a domestic replacement is simply not viable in the short term. Even the U.S. may have a hard time um, having a replacement build in the next year. That's competitive. So, so you hear these stories about the impact that these drones are having and the challenges that, frankly, you know, for individuals and NGOs like yourselves are hard to overcome, but for someone that has the scale and capability of the U.S. government or even the Ukrainian government, it's a much more solvable problem. And it's interesting how this has all been done in a very decentralized way it doesn't seem like it's most efficient, right? Uh, yes and no. Uh, I would say that the downsides to doing it in a decentralized way are obvious. One is that you have a uh, more diverse set of products than if you were to buy them in a centralized way, so it's more difficult to maintain. It's harder to do this friend and foe identification. And you're also not getting the benefit of wholesale pricing if you buy the retail separately in small batches. At the same time, you know for a fact that you're buying what's actually working because the majority of the money being spent is, a, is money being spent by the troops themselves. Uh, I mean, by my estimate, the troops have spent several billion dollars out of their own pockets on buying this, out of their salaries. They would not be buying things that don't work. So they provide you the strongest signal of demand. The problem with that is that their resources are very limited. And the NGOs that have been providing uh, a significant number of these as well they are significantly limited and their donations flow if you look at the profile over time most of the donations were raised in the first three months after the war started and then they started to go way down because private donors thought that uncle sam has now got it because when the 40 billion dollar bill was passed uh, in may of 2022 they simply got crowded out. They thought that yeah, the government would be buying the exact same things that they were buying and their efforts would be negligible. 
Um, so these have been very effective routes to get the products into Ukraine, maybe not fully capitalizing on returns to scale, but uh, the government certainly has the ability to now take advantage of the fact that we really know what works because we've tested all of this through a large number of decentralized deployments and try to put some uh, scale into this and, and buy them in bulk and immediately saturate the market. The beauty of these products, again, if you look at the reasons why lethal aid is constrained, none of these reasons apply to non-lethal aid. There are far fewer supply chain problems for non-lethal products because they're built for much larger commercial market. They are not requiring the same compliance burden as lethal assets because if you lose a high mars on the way to ukraine that's a big problem if you lose a laptop on the way to ukraine nobody's going to care and finally they are not going to cause an escalation these assets are certainly not attack homes. these are not f-16s these are not abrams tanks these are, these are things that any consumer can buy on their own so they're not escalatory and so to the extent to which lethal aid is bottlenecked on these issues that are not money I believe that the money would be really well spent on these categories that augment whatever lethal assets already are in the field and the ones that will come at you know, great expense and uh, especially given the expenditure of ammo and the lack of uh, inventory and manufacturing capacity, making sure that every shell counts is a very high priority and these assets are needed for that. Well, Andre, you've certainly made a very compelling case on this. Thank you so much for coming on, and thank you for everything you're doing for this cause. Thank you. Thanks for having me.